Namaste. So, in chapter 5 of Lakshmi Tantra, the creation is described as a cosmic egg. In other words, the universe wasn't born, it hatched. <laughs> now, why is this significant? Because in many scriptures, especially those that characterize Vishnu as the supreme, there's a theory called emanation, that Vishnu emanated all the materials of the universal creation. And here this is shown not to be true, that actually everything, the whole material creation, comes from Shakti. You see, this is the thing. Um, we talked about the difference between Shiva and Shakti being the fundamental duality between the subject and object of consciousness. And then she goes on, whether you call her Shakti or Mahalakshmi or any name that refers to the female Godhead, she goes on to actually do all the work of creation. You see, I mean, it's very similar to the reproduction of human beings, where the male does a little bit in the beginning, <laughs> but the female really does most of the work. So we have to acknowledge this. We have to also um, give her the credit and, and worship her accordingly. Otherwise, we risk offending her. And because she is Maya, uh, the illusion, she holds the key to liberation. Not the male side, the female side of God. And now if sometimes the male side is seen as giving liberation, it's always actually her. In fact, the four Chatur Vyuha, Vishnu forms, Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha, all emanate from her. So, <laughs> she is the mother. She gives birth, literally, to God. Huh? Holy Mother of God. See, these sayings now start to have meaning in the context of the creation of the universe by Shakti. So how does she do it exactly? Well, chapter 5 is all about the creation of the universal egg, Hiranyagarbha. Hiranyagarbha means literally golden egg. So in this golden egg, this is an effulgent egg. It's not, you know, an ordinary egg. <laughs> But it's full of power, and it's full of opulence. It's full of all the potencies of the material creation. Everything that is, everything that is manifest, is in that egg. So, we can understand that she is the mother of all. In fact, she is everything from, you know, the smallest atom all the way up to the universal egg. She is even consciousness. She's the consciousness and also the egoity uh, of Hari, of Vishnu. So if she is his, his consciousness and his ego, I mean, what's left, right? <laughs> She's everything. So we should start to approach her like that. We should start to, to worship her like that, to conceive of her like that, and to be thankful to her for everything she's done to us, which is everything <laughs> she's done for us that makes us what we are. She talks about the senses. Not only is she the senses, she's also the sense objects and the process of sense perception. 
she talks about she herself as consciousness, pure consciousness. That means consciousness without an object. Because in the beginning, there is no object. The, the material world hasn't been created yet. There's only consciousness and without an object. So she is that consciousness. That means everything about us, all the way up to and including our consciousness, is actually her. So could there be any more influential or any more powerful being than her? I mean, it's, it's described as a very good argument in the second chapter of the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, which we went over in a previous series, that, okay, Vishnu is lying on the bed of Sankarshan. So in some way, Vishnu is dependent on Sankarshan, at least as a throne or a bed. And where is Sankarshan? He's in the causal ocean, the milk ocean. So Sankarshan is also dependent on the ocean. And where does this ocean come from? See, this is also Shakti. Not only that, this, this scripture goes further and points out an ocean or any body of water has to sit in some receptacle. It has to sit in a container. Uh, a kuta is the word, or kunda. So what is the kunda of the causal ocean? That is also Shakti. See, she is the womb of the cosmic creation. So she is everything. Huh? Everything that happens, happens because of her and happens by her will and her intelligence, which is considerable. <laughs> her power is so strong that even demons that couldn't be killed by anybody else, she can kill them. See? So this is the mother. This is the goddess. Now, in the past, especially the past of the Western world, the theory of male dominance has been dominant. <laughs> but the male, in, in the, even the realm of Godhead, has no power without the female. The female is the Shakti, the power. Yes, the male may be the powerful. He may be the executive head in some way. But the female is the one who gets everything done. Uh, it's stated right at the beginning of Saundarya Lahari, uh, which we also have a series of one, that without Shakti, Shiva can't even move. He can't do anything. So we have to understand Shiva and Shakti, Vishnu and the Divine Mother, see, Lakshmi, she is an integral part of the Godhead. In fact, the Godhead is the two of them together. It can't be just one or the other, see. Well, that's why the, the male dominant sects that theorize that the male form of God is the, is the final and ultimate source of everything are, are not supported by the Shastra, especially by the uh, Upanishads, you see, <clears throat> because they give the mother as the source. You know, she's the one who does the work of creation. She's the one who hatches the cosmic egg. <laughs> so Narayan and Lakshmi create the cosmic egg. And then Uma and uh, Shankar, they hatch it, they open it, they break it. And what comes out? The whole cosmic creation, it's like the cornucopia, you know, everything is in there. 
You can read it in the fifth chapter. You, in fact, you should go listen to that really right now, the fifth chapter reading. I know it's long and complicated. And, you know, I thought for a while of making diagrams and stuff to show how everything is related. But, you know, first of all, there aren't enough views to make it worthwhile to me. And second, if you're really a serious student of Lakshmi Tantra, you'll do that for yourself. You'll make the diagrams and you'll study the terminology and figure it all out for yourself if you really want to know. See, a long time ago we did a series called Matrix Learning. Here's the playlist. And Matrix Learning gives you all the tools that you need to figure out anything. <laughs> this scripture is actually pretty easy to figure out. You know, but even things that are very ambiguous and hard to figure out, like Buddha's teaching, become easy once you have the tools that we give in matrix learning. But even the people who took the matrix learning course, when it came right down to it, didn't want to apply the knowledge. This is the most mind-blowing thing, huh? I mean, we spent over a month, we spent like six weeks going over the tools for learning and duplication and understanding. And then when we got to the ontology section, everybody crashed. In fact, they started manifesting all the symptoms of misunderstood terms that we had covered in the first part. And they couldn't see it. They couldn't acknowledge it. They couldn't admit it. And at that point, I lost interest. I'm like, you guys, you know, you're not worth my time. <laughs> because you can't admit that you didn't get the material in the first part of the course. So I'm like, you know, who needs this, right? So instead of spoon feeding you, it's better if you do the work, you'll learn it better and you'll be able to apply it better. So you might ask, well, what is the application of this knowledge? about the cosmic egg and everything. Well, guess what? We also came from an egg. First of all, the jivas, the, the uh, souls who take birth in the material world, are part of the contents of that egg. And not only that, even this body comes from an egg, isn't it? And then the egg, it starts out as one cell, and then it divides into two and four and eight and so on. So this is exactly the kind of process that's mentioned in this, in this scripture as to how the body of the universe develops. And according to the hermetic law, the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. The development of the universe and the development of the human being go in parallel. I'm not going to say they're the same, but they rhyme. So we can learn an awful lot about ourselves and where we come from by studying the description of this creation of the universe by the goddess Lakshmi. Lakshmi actually is the mode of passion in the creation. Because to create something, you have to be passionate about it, isn't it? And then she also emanates uh, Maha Kali. And Kali is the mode of ignorance, Tamoguna, which is destruction. Whenever you have creation, you also have destruction. And then in between, you have maintenance or support, and that's Maha Saraswati, the mode of goodness, Sattva Guna. So these three, huh, passion, ignorance, and goodness, are always constantly in motion in relation to one another. At one time, one of them will appear to be dominant, and another time, another will be. But they're not really competitors. Huh? 
Just like if you have uh, two different currents in the ocean, or three, coming together, huh? they, they each create a separate group of waves. Does that mean that the waves are competing with, other, with each other? No. They just, they just are what they are. You know? And if we overlay some mm, patterns that we perceive and then call it competition, that's on us. It's not in their essence. In the same way, it's not in the essence of the gunas to compete with one another. But it's actually a cooperation to create this world, which is so bewildering that even very intelligent people can't figure it out. You see, and that's why we need the scriptures. The scriptures will show us not only where it came from and where it's going, but how it works, how we can get out of it and solve all of our problems by the process of self-realization. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om.